The first thing I noticed about the house wasn't the peeling paint or the overgrown lawn, but the locked cellar door at the end of the hall. A door that was conspicuously darker than its surroundings, as if it had absorbed years of fear and dread. The real estate agent, a slick man in his forties with hair that looked unnaturally black, was quick to brush it off. Oh, that old thing? Just a part of the house's rustic charm, he laughed, swiftly leading me toward the kitchen, which was illuminated by warm, inviting sunlight. As I signed the paperwork and shook his clammy hand, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had just sealed a Faustian pact. But life hadn't been kind lately. After my layoff and the dissolution of a long-term relationship, my budget had tightened. The house was a steal, an oasis of affordability in a desert of exorbitant real estate. I told myself I could look past the quirks, the cracks in the ceiling, and even that menacing cellar door. What's the worst that could happen? It's just a door after all. I spent the day unpacking, lifting boxes marked kitchen, books, and miscellaneous into their respective rooms. The afternoon light began to wane, casting long shadows that seemed to grow darker and more distorted as they stretched across the wooden floor. It was as if the house were subtly changing its anatomy, rearranging itself when I wasn't looking. Stop being ridiculous, I chided myself. The stress and the loneliness were playing tricks on my mind. As night drew its dark curtain over the world outside, I decided to sort through the master bedroom. Pulling open drawers and hanging clothes in the closet, I felt a semblance of domesticity returning. Then I found it. Tucked behind a loose panel in the back of a closet was an old yellowed envelope. My hands trembled as I slid a finger under the sealed flap as if I were desecrating some sacred artifact. Inside was a single piece of lined paper, written in frantic, almost illegible handwriting. My eyes darted over the text. Whoever you are, do not go down to the cellar. I can't explain everything now, but you must never unlock that door. No matter the sounds you hear or the feelings you get, never, ever go down there. It's not a room, it's a mouth, and it's hungry. Do yourself a favor, leave and never come back. The note was unsigned. A chill snaked down my spine, each vertebra tingling with a mixture of dread and disbelief. My eyes involuntarily darted to the end of the hall, where the cellar door stood in its eternal vigil, darker than ever in the evening gloom. It's probably a prank, or maybe even the scribblings of a disturbed mind, I thought, attempting to rationalize what I had just read. But as I stood there, holding that piece of paper that reeked of desperation, I couldn't silence the growing whisper in my mind, a whisper that urged me to heed the warning, yet also beckoned me toward the unspeakable horrors that lay beyond the cellar door. I shouldn't have moved here, but now that I have, can I really ignore this? Night folded over the house like a shroud, and sleep proved elusive. Each creak of the floorboards seemed amplified every draft a spectral caress. The note's words ricocheted around my mind, each repetition magnifying their urgency and inscrutability. It's a mouth, and it's hungry. I tried to dismiss it as a macabre joke or the remnants of the previous owner's insanity, but the house itself seemed to argue against such rationalizations. The subtle symphony of its nightly sounds, the distant murmur of pipes, the whisper of wind against the eaves seemed now like utterances in a language I was on the verge of understanding but would never wish to speak. For days, I went about my routines in a fog of unsettled awareness. I began to notice oddities. Objects subtly misplaced, a mug I distinctly remembered leaving on the kitchen table now sitting on the counter, a book that I'd placed on the bedside table found on the living room couch, the disquiet crept into every corner of my life. Friends called, but their voices seemed distant, their laughter grating. I couldn't focus on work or chores. My world had contracted to the four walls of the house and the relentless pull of the cellar door. It's probably rats moving things or the house settling. Houses do that, right? But then came the whisper. 
One simple, devastatingly clear word breathed softly into the still air of my bedroom as I lay sleepless one night. Come. The sound sliced through the veil of my self-imposed ignorance. This was no longer something I could attribute to wind or the nocturnal habits of an old house. It was a voice, faint, almost inaudibly low, but undeniably a voice. My skin tightened as if readying itself for a wound. All the petty justifications and doubts shattered in that moment. Whatever lived in this house was beyond the reach of rational explanation. I got up, my body moving with a sense of inevitability, and walked toward the hall. There it was, the cellar door, like the gaping maw of some dark leviathan, drawing me in with a gravitational force I couldn't resist. My fingers traced the worn grooves of the wood, down to the rusted bolt that kept its secrets confined. This is it. The breaking point. I either turn back now, or I fling myself into whatever abyss waits beyond this door. I stood on the precipice of a choice that teetered between reason and madness. The whisper had ruptured the dam of my restraint. I needed to know, to confront whatever malevolent force had insinuated itself into my life, even if it meant disregarding the frantic warnings of the note that had started it all. My hand closed around the cold metal of the bolt. My hand hesitated over the bolt, every fiber of my being screaming at me to pull back, to retreat from the maw that yawned before me. The voice, the note, the ominous aura, all pointed to an inescapable conclusion that to proceed would be folly of the highest order. Don't do it. You can still turn back. But the need to know, to confront this invisible puppeteer pulling at the strings of my sanity, overwhelmed my caution. With a shaking hand, I slid the bolt free. The door creaked open with an agonized moan, as if relieved to unburden its dark secret to a new confidant. I flicked on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the gloom like a knife through thick velvet. The stairs leading down were steep and worn, blanketed in layers of dust that testified to years of neglect. With each step, the air grew colder and thicker, as if I were wading deeper into some ancient subterranean sea. The cellar itself was expansive, much larger than I had imagined, stretching into darkness beyond the reach of my flashlight. The walls were lined with wooden shelves, covered in years of grime and cobwebs, glass jars containing unidentifiable substances, tools whose purposes I dared not contemplate, and other miscellaneous bric-a-brac filled the spaces. This place is a tomb, a mausoleum of forgotten memories and forsaken lives. And then I saw it the source of the faint glow that beckoned from the rear of the cellar. A circle of flickering candles, meticulously arranged around a strange sigil etched into the floor. It was an otherworldly design, like a spiderweb interlaced with geometric shapes and arcane symbols, too intricate to be the work of human hands. As my eyes adjusted, other horrors materialized in the peripheral gloom. A doll with glassy eyes that seemed to follow me its grin a fixed rictus of malevolent glee. A moth-eaten armchair facing an ancient television set that buzzed to life as I passed, the screen filled with static that seemed to form elusive shapes if stared at for too long. A series of photographs, faces scratched out, pinned to a corkboard beside what appeared to be a lock of human hair. Each object a monument to some unspeakable act or dread ritual contributing to an aura of malevolence that saturated the air like a fetid mist. My hand wavered, my flashlight's beam trembling as I took it all in. Each item felt like a piece of a sinister puzzle, one that I was now irrevocably involved in. What have I done? What Pandora's box have I flung open in my reckless quest for answers? Even as regret flooded through me, I felt a tingling sense of expectation. As if the room, no, the entity was waiting for something. My arrival had set some inexorable sequence of events into motion, and there was no turning back. I had descended into the mouth of darkness, and it was hungry. My pulse reverberated in my ears like a drumbeat of impending doom. As I gazed upon the arcane circle, my flashlight flickered, the batteries succumbing to an unseen force that sapped not only electrical power, 
but also my resolve. Then, as if dictated by some malevolent script, the candles flared brighter for a moment, casting an ethereal glow that illuminated the room in its full, unsettling detail. And there, in the center of the sigil, a form began to manifest, a shadowy outline that grew denser and more tangible with each passing second. My breath caught in my throat as the figure took shape, a grotesque amalgamation of human and something far more ancient and malevolent. Do you understand now? The words slithered into my mind, bypassing my ears entirely, filling my consciousness with its insidious cadence. You are not the first to unleash me, but you could be the last. A chain of souls has kept me confined, their curiosity their downfall, and now you're part of this everlasting cycle. So it's true. All of it. The note, the whispers, the irresistible lure. It was all a setup. A web spun across generations to trap the unwary. Freedom is a tantalizing dream for beings such as myself, it continued. Every opening of that door weakens the seals that bind me, and your presence, your very life force, adds to the energy I require to break free. In that moment, the sheer enormity of what I had done crashed over me like a tidal wave of regret. By unlocking the door, by descending into the cellar, I had not just risked my own soul, but potentially unleashed a malevolent force upon the world. But how do I fix this? Can it even be fixed? Ah, the flicker of hope. A delicious emotion, it purred. The cycle can be broken, the door sealed for all eternity, but the price is significant. I braced myself, my mind racing through grim possibilities. Your life, it intoned, a willing sacrifice, a soul freely given, can lock this door and erase the sigil. But know this, you'd be saving countless lives at the expense of your own. My heart felt like it was being squeezed by an iron fist. The choice was monstrous, yet strangely poetic, a single decision balancing on the knife's edge between self-preservation and altruism. If I walk away, the cycle continues, the entity grows stronger, and someone else eventually takes my place. But if I stay? With a newfound clarity, the weight of my choices, both past and imminent, coalesced into a single point of crystalline understanding. I... I choose to end this. I declared, my voice surprisingly steady. I'll pay the price. A moment of silence stretched into an eternity, then a low, rumbling laugh filled the room. So be it, the entity murmured, its form beginning to dissolve, the candles flickering out one by one. The door will lock, the circle will fade, and I will remain a hungry shadow, bound by your sacrifice. Darkness closed in but it was a comforting darkness, a final, tranquil embrace. As I felt my consciousness wane, my last thought was a fragile bloom of hope that my choice had indeed sealed the darkness away, that my life had served as the lock on a door that should never be opened.